good afternoon everyone uh, i welcome all for the third lecture uh, of the introductory lecture series of on earth and planetary sciences um before today's lecture i would like to briefly introduce our today's speaker we have professor r shankar is retired in august 2017 as a professor from mangalore university where he joined in 1980 He had early education in his native place, that is B.Sc. Um, in Chitradurg, and for M.Sc. in Applied Geology and Ph.D. from I.I.T. Bombay, where he secured first rank and was awarded the Institute Medal and the Institute National Prize. He was a Commonwealth Academic Staff Fellow at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. He was con conferred the National Mineral Award in by the Government yeah. of India. Sir C V Raman Award in 1998 by Government of Karnataka, Young Scientist Award in 1995 by the Karnataka Association for the Advancement of Science, and he visited 26 countries on all continents for training, research, conferences, and the Earth Science Olympiad. He is an advisor, chair, International Geoscience Education Organization, member of the IUGS Commission on Education, National. Uh, Coordinator of the Earth Science Olympiad, Chair of International Earth Science Olympiad, and many more. Professor R. Shankar is a member of several professional bodies in India as well as abroad, and he is also a founder, research coordinator, or Ocean Science and Technology Cell, which was set up at Mangalore University by the De uh, Department of Ocean Development. He published more than eighty refereed uh, research articles in international and national journals. and his interests are mainly environmental geology environmental magnetism paleo climate paleo oceanography and marine asteroid geochemistry with this brief introduction i welcome professor r shankar he will <coughs> talk about how earth science is important in our day to day life sir over to you thank you namisha for your kind words of introduction and also thanks for the kind invitation to Uh, speak to uh, high school students and some from Manipal University this afternoon. Thanks so much. I must confess that you know talking to young students is very dear to my heart, and I'm so pleased to be uh, here at my home to be talking to you, my dear students. Uh, <clears throat> As this is an introductory talk, introduction to earth sciences and what it is all about. and most of you are not familiar with earth science i'll try to avoid the technical jargon and i'll try to make it as simple and as comprehensible as possible to you so if i use technical jargon please you know raise your hand either during my talk or at the end of the talk and ask me questions i'll be more than glad to discuss with you all right so let it be a more of a dialogue than a monologue <clears throat> Okay, let me share screen with you, and let's get started. Yes. Can all of you hear me properly? Sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. No problem. Okay. Yes. And. Um, So you can share your screen. Yes, I did that. And can you see my screen? The yes. Title, right? Yes. Yes. How is earth science important in our daily life? Uh, sir, you can uh, make it slideshow. I mean, full screen. Hello. It's actually full screen for me, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm also. Same thing happens. So I went to slides show and then I click on the hourglass. Uh, Is it full screen now? Uh, um. Uh, no. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's full screen now. Full screen. Yes. Are you sir, able to read? How is Earth science? Yes, sir. How is Earth science important in our daily life? Sir, can uh, can you please uh, uh, hide that stop sharing thing? Hide. 
Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you, sir. All right, now. Yes, sir. So this is a top deliver to students of Manipal University plus some high schools in Manipal region, right? <clears throat> I would like to dedicate my talk, today's talk, in the loving memory of Dr. M. Prithuraj, who was with you and with us and left, you know, less than one month ago. You know, Prithuraj was my very dear student, very pet student. I taught him at Mangalore University in 1980. And later on, you know, when after he joined the Department of Science and Technology, I would say that everyone who was involved in earth science research must have come across uh, this very nice, fine human being called uh, Prithviraj. And he has touched everybody's, you know, research lives, uh, you know, too much. I mean, he has done a lot of work and uh, everyone knew him. So, this is in memory of uh, Prithviraj. So let me give a brief uh, idea about what I'm going to talk in the next 30 or 35 minutes. First, I'll give an introduction, then resources, natural and human induced hazards, and how, you know, earth science is important in all of these things, in engineering geological projects, in uh, urban planning, how it's important to address certain climate change issues, then medical geology, forensic geology, planetary geology, and some remarks about career in, careers in earth sciences, all right? So, <clears throat> when I was sort of your age, my father asked me, hey, Shankar, do you want to do MBBS? I said, no, because two of my elder brothers were already studying MBBS, so I wanted to study something different. What was that something different? It was earth science for me. So I'd like to say, uh, dear friends, that there is not just medicine and engineering and biotechnology courses. There are a whole range of fascinating and absorbing uh, courses and careers possible. And one of them is earth science. And earth science is one thing that embraces all aspects of our lives. You know, aluminum to zinc, you need every everywhere. Hairpin to aeroplanes, you need metals. For our uh, energy needs, we need petrol, diesel, natural gas, and so on and so forth. So it touches our lives very, very closely. Every single day, every moment. And when I say earth science, it is not just solid earth, but it also includes atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the cryosphere. Cryosphere meaning that part of the earth that comprises of icebergs, glaciers, and everything that is water in the solid form, and planetary geology. All of these things come under earth science, not just the solid earth, all right? Now, let's see how you know, earth sciences are important in the exploration and extraction of uh, resources that we need for our daily, daily lives. Firstly, we want water to drink, right? So water is a mineral and geologists are uh, gainfully engaged in exploration for uh, surface water. We, we have it already, but you know, you need to test it and uh, supply to the general public. And then we have underground water, but we don't call it underground because underground gives a very bad meaning. So we call it groundwater. So we explore for groundwater and supply it to people. Then we need metals, iron, aluminum, copper, and a whole range of metals for our needs. So geologists, what they do, earth scientists, they have certain methods of exploration, which is geophysical, geological, and geochemical. Geological is, we use our earth science knowledge. Uh, geophysical means <clears throat> we make use of certain uh, physical principles like magnetic properties, uh, gravity, electrical resistivity, and so on and so forth. Then geochemical prospecting or geomical exploration is to use our knowledge of chemical elements in rocks, soils, water, and then explore for uh, mineral deposits. So we use all of these methods to explore and uh, extract metal deposits or the ores, ores of iron, aluminum, and so on. Then we also need non-metals like sulfur and all the raw materials for several industries, for the cement industry, fertilizer industry, 
glass industry, you know, everywhere we need earth resources, raw materials, and that is obtained through earth science. And then we need construction materials like size stone, size gullu, then slabs, sheets, road metal, sand, bricks, all these come from uh, Mother Earth. And then there are fossil fuels <clears throat> which we use for our energy needs. You have coal, petroleum or oil, natural gas, shale gas, gas hydrate. I'm not going into all of these details because it's going to take a long time and uh, our objective is to give you an idea of what earth science is. But if someone, someone wants to know more about a certain aspect, uh, we'll explain uh, later. So all of these are different uh, energy resources. Because there's a lot of hue and cry about uh, carbon footprint and COP27, you know, is trying to bring down the carbon dioxide emissions and that's a different issue. <clears throat> and then we have nuclear minerals in terms of uranium and thorium, which again are minerals obtained uh, from beach sands, rocks. And then we have renewable energy, which is the need of the hour. We can obtain energy from wind. You must have seen windmills. In my hometown, Chitradurga, there's a whole range of uh, you know, huge fan like structures set up. These are the windmills. We can obtain energy from ocean waves, tidal currents, and uh, regular ocean currents. And then thermal gradient, that is the OTEC of the ocean thermal energy conversion. And also use the salinity gradient in the ocean water mass and extract energy. Earth science is also important in uh, in predicting, preventing, and mitigating natural and human-induced hazards. Now, let's see what these are. There are so many. I'll just list each one of them and uh, say a few things. One is floods, droughts, earthquakes. You know, floods and droughts depend on how much rainfall is there or how much rainfall is not there. But human activities can exacerbate or complicate the situation. You now, with the same amount of rainfall, you know, you can flood the area because of wrong practices. Right in cities, you can see this in Bangalore city. Even if there is a short uh, spell of rain, the roads are flooded. That means, you know, we have used so much concrete to cover the surface that the rainwater does not have enough space and opportunity to sink in. So this is what happens when uh, we interfere with natural processes. And same with droughts. And then we have earthquakes. You know, it is possible to predict earthquakes, but then if it has uh, got to be meaningful, we have to predict three items of an earthquake. When, where, and at what intensity it will strike. Even if one of them is not correct, then the whole prediction becomes useless. So it is still a very tricky game, but you know people are still trying to, you know, do more research and refine the models to predict earthquakes. So earthquake, uh, earth science comes in here, <clears throat> and then you have tsunamis. Tsunamis are huge, you know, tides or uh, waves that are created because of an earthquake in the oceans. So these are uh, very devastating because they come at speeds of uh, 650 uh, miles per hour, something like an aircraft coming at that speed. And the height is about 50, 60 meters. And uh, India has set up you know, certain sensors in the Indian Ocean. And we now have a, a functional a tsunami warning system. That's a good thing. And then volcanic eruptions, we have one in uh, the Barren Island that is uh, under months. There are others in other parts of the world. Whenever there is volcanic eruption, there are mass movements like landslide, rock slide, mud flow, and so on and so forth. Perhaps you have seen some of these in films. I do not know. But uh, mainland India, mainland India is not facing this problem. 
but we have had uh, volcanic eruptions millions of years ago as a result in you know, maharashtra gujarat parts of madhya pradesh andhra karnataka are now covered with uh, lava flows and then we have cyclones storms and hurricanes you now these are all uh, meteorological uh, phenomena that take place and it is possible to predict uh, at least uh, some time in advance so that we will be prepared for these uh, landfalls of cyclones or storms and we can evacuate people where it is going to be very devastating then coastal erosion you know people who are there in manipal mangalore area this is a very common problem you know this is something that uh, <clears throat> we must appreciate and realize see coastal erosion simply means you know huge waves during monsoon hitting the land with a greater force and then destroying whatever is there on the land but these waves are very gentle during summer but uh, during monsoon season when the rainfall is there uh, south southwest monsoon particularly there's more energy in the winds and they produce huge waves and these huge waves carry a lot of energy they come and hit the coast and they damage the structure there if it is a rock it uh, you know affects the rock if there's a house it uh, affects the house if there are people people will be affected so my suggestion is not to construct sea walls and then waste money rather allow some space for mother nature to play there it's her playground and we must not encroach upon her playground we must set aside some space 500 meters and then do our activities but every year this doesn't happen that's another story there are forest fires both natural and uh, human uh, induced and they burn a lot of uh, forest area soil erosion you know all this because we remove uh, the vegetation the top soil is removed and it it is carried away by rain water the rivers acid rain this is a more recent uh, hazard because of our burning of fossil fuels pumping in a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere which uh, combines with water and becomes carbonic acid or sulfur dioxide combining with water to become sulfuric acid so all these acid mixed waters come down they have a, a lower ph they are acidic they react with uh, <clears> the <throat> rocks at a much faster pace it's uh, it affects the soil uh, ph it affects the corals in the oceans and so on and so forth then there are heat waves and cold spells uh, mostly due to human induced uh, reasons and then you see we engage ourselves in several engineering geological projects i'll tell the tell you what these are and geologists earth scientists are involved in locating in designing in constructing operating and maintaining all of these engineering geological projects now let's see what these are firstly we have huge dams we construct dams and earth scientists are responsible for giving the location where is a good place to build a dam with minimal cost and then we have nuclear power plants like the one in kaiga both dams and nuclear power plants have to be located in seismically safe zones seismically means earthquake not earthquake prone zones but a zone an area where earthquake earthquakes do not happen otherwise if it is earthquake prone if there's an earthquake you now the dam will break a huge amount of water will be you know released and a nuclear power plant if any damage is there a lot of radiation comes out and it can be disastrous we have had examples in the past and we do not want that to happen again and then reservoirs these are places where we store a lot of water surface water by constructing a dam you are creating a reservoir on this side and you do not want the water in the reservoir to leak into the cracks and fissures underneath 
So we want an area for a reservoir which is devoid of cracks and fissures and joints. If it is really inevitable, then we put cement concrete and block these cracks and fissures. So all these only geologists can suggest. Foundation is very important, whether it is for buildings or even for people. We need a solid foundation so that our moral character, our career can be on a solid footing. So same with buildings and the skyscrapers, high rise buildings and in several other projects, unless you know, we have a good foundation laid, the structures built upon them will be precarious and they may get damaged, collapse. Then we have tunnels through which you know trains go or you know vehicles move and we got to unline the tunnel in such a way that it is safe. Now this depends on the structure of the rocks in what direction they're inclining, whether inclining this way or that way, this way or that way, different you know parameters are there. Uh, geologists will determine all this and suggest which is the proper direction for a tunnel in a given area. Same with highways, railway lines and metro lines. And runway is very important. You know, you do not want a tabletop runway as in Mangalore Airport. You know, we have had at least one accident in the more recent times. I've landed in Mangalore several times, but so far I've been lucky, I've been alive. So if you want to construct a runway, you need to have a proper uh, place, proper space, and a geologist can survey and say it's a good area. This gives you more details of all of the civil engineering projects and what an earth scientists can contribute, but I won't go into all of the details. I heard some of them, but uh, we can see it later. This is the and you have to Earth science is very important in urban planning. You know, how we plan our cities is very important. And uh, this is not happening much in the country, except perhaps cities like Delhi, which is a capital, and also Chandigarh, it's, uh, it's good planning. But in most of the places, it is something much to be desired. <clears throat> now, basically, urban planning means where we should build what? or where we should not build something. Essentially, this is what it means. And then we have water bodies in a, in a given city or town. And these are places that we must conserve. We must desilt them and then uh, allow water to be stored. But what has happened in big cities like Bangalore and other places is because of the high real estate cost, you know, we are greedy. We encroach upon the lake area, lake bed, put you know sand or mud, and then reclaim certain parts of the area. And uh, we have destroyed these lakes. In Bangalore, this is for sure. Recently, we had uh, heavy rainfall, and then a lot of flooding took place. You must have read all this in the newspapers. So the real culprits are we, because we have been greedy. We have, we have encroached upon the lake bed. And where will the water go? When there is no place for it in the lake, it comes to us. And that's exactly what happened a couple of months ago. You know, we built uh, buildings on Raja Kalwe, stormwater drains. That's a classic example as to what should not be done. And then there are certain climate change issues where earth science becomes very important. First, Let's understand what is climate change. There's a lot of ambiguity in people's minds, including some professional geologists. Let me clarify this. Now, climate has changed from time immemorial. There's no doubt about it. But we restrict the usage of the term climate change only to those changes in climatic parameters induced by human activities, all right? Only those changes induced by human activities, anthropogenic activities. You know, just to give you a background, there has been what we call natural variability and human-induced 
you know, variability in the climate, natural and human induced. So both are responsible. Okay. But human activities have become very prominent only in the past uh, two centuries or so. Even before that, there was carbon dioxide produced and it went to the atmosphere. But the rate at which CO2 went up was rather slow and it took a, a long, long time. Whereas today in the past 200 years, in particular in this uh, past five decades, what's happened is the carbon dioxide is pumped in into the atmosphere at a much, much higher rate. And that is the whole issue. So this is what we call climate change, change in climate induced by human activities. And as a result, you know, we have the global warming. The temperature of the earth has increased. The mother earth has fever. And as a result, the ocean water expands with increase in temperature. Not only that, our glaciers and ice sheets melt because of the higher temperature. And the melt water comes down the rivers and joins the ocean. So the sea level goes up. And then there is flooding and all types of uh, problems associated with uh, global warming. You know, earth scientists, uh, they work on deciphering or understanding how the climate was in the past. How much was the rainfall? You know, we call that paleoclimatology. Paleo means past. In earth sciences, paleo means past. Past climatology and past oceanography. How were the oceanic conditions in the past? That is paleo oceanography. In fact, our own research group uh, at Mangalore University worked on this aspect. We worked on ocean sediment cores and then late sediment cores and uh, tried to understand how the rainfall was in the past. And some of my former PhD students are at uh, Mangalore, uh, sorry, Manipal University. Don't know whether they are there or not, but they'll be able to say more about all this. So we collect data of the past and we combine it with the present meteorological data. And with these, you know, we can model and predict the future climatic scenario. So I would say the history of the past and a mastery over the present we can solve the uh, mystery of the future. Okay, so past and present telling us about the future. Now, how to slow down climate change? You know, this is a highly geopolitical issue when it comes to uh, this um, United Nations Convention on Climate Change, COP27 meeting that was there recently in. Uh, in Egypt. So we fight to know whether India and China should uh, reduce their carbon dioxide uh, output. But if we take the per capita output of uh, carbon dioxide, ours is much, much less compared to the Western countries. Take the US. So that's a different issue. But without going into all of those aspects, I would urge that all of us must not abuse and misuse the resources that the earth has given us. We got to be judiciously using them. I would say reduce the consumption. It's good and don't waste anything. When I say anything, it means everything. Food, water, electricity, uh, petrol, diesel, anything, clothes even. So that's the only way we can uh, combat climate change. And then there is a very interesting field called medical geology. You know, this uh, studies the health effects of geological materials and processes on human beings and animals with both good and possibly hazardous results. So here what we do is, you know, both our scientists and medical and uh, public health experts collaborate and study the, you know, hazards or good things about the geological materials on our health. Hippocrates, more than a thousand years ago, said, if you want to learn about the health of a population, if you want to learn about the health of a population, look at the air they breathe, look at the water they drink, 
and the places where they live. Such a wonderful statement. My father used to tell me when I was an adolescent, you should be in good company. And he used to quote, if you want to know the character of a person, you don't have to study that person, but just look at the company he has and you can easily know what sort of a person he is. Mostly it is correct. So essentially we have problems with very little or too much of micronutrients and minerals that are there in our food and environment. Uh, just to give one example, health problems created by arsenic and fluorine in groundwater. You know, there's fluorosis, there is uh, arsenic, particularly in West Bengal. A lot of problems are there. The related field is agrogeology. You know, it essentially caters to our farmers. So basically, it depends on what nutrients are there are not there in the soil and how this is going to affect the crop. And this is something very interesting, forensic geology. As the very term indicates, it is the application of earth science to aid crime investigations. So if you have some friends in the lawyer community, legal community, tell them about this forensic geology. We know only about forensic science, right? But there is a specific subject called forensic geology. Just one example. Early forensic geology case, you know, it's mentioned in Sherlock Holmes novel. <coughs> and the case was solved by comparing the soil from the suspect's pants, you know, to the mud's mineral content that is mica in the field of crime. So you basically, basically correlate the mud that is there in the pants of a suspect. And you take the mud sample from the uh, scene of the crime. And you try to match. If it matches, you know, that is one proof that this is the guy who committed the crime. <coughs> there are so many such instances. Just one example. Then we have what is called planetary geology. You know, this is studying other planets. And trying to find out what sort of processes are taking place there. You know, why this is important is because we have space exploration in full swing in the past few decades, and we are in quest of a new abode where the humans can inhabit other planets, whether the conditions there are able to sustain our life. So we want to make new homes there. We want to search for new mineral resources, as though we have a shortage of resources or shortage of home here. Anyway, it's the curiosity of uh, humans that is leading to all of this. And then quest for supremacy in space exploration. And I think that is one of the reasons why a lot of money has been invested in space exploration and uh, planetary exploration. You might be interested to know that much less money has been spent on ocean exploration, exploration of our inner space compared to exploration of outer space. We don't know what is there in our oceans, except in you know, some patchy knowledge. And earth science knowledge is important to understand the processes in other planets. You know, we have uh, uh, exploration of the Mars and the moon. So we want to know what sort of processes uh, took place there in the past. Is there water there? And if water is there, was there, has it left any imprint in terms of uh, channels, you know, river courses, floodplain deposits? Because we as earth scientists know all of these processes and products. So we are in a better position to, to study other planets and make out whether those similar conditions, similar processes took place there. So we can say whether it is fit for human habitation, do we have resources there and so on and so forth. I gave a very brief idea as to where earth science comes into picture in our daily lives and also some inkling of 
what an earth scientist does. Now, if you are interested in uh, higher education and careers in earth science, I'd like to say a few things now. You now, one can become a professional geologist. One can become a hydrogeologist. One can become a geophysicist. Now, geologist mainly does the mapping and then he finds out the structure of rocks and he finds out the origin of rocks and these will help in in uh, exploration for mineral deposits also partially in uh, hydrogeological work a hydrogeologist essentially helps in finding out where water is okay you know he uses the resistivity method not the water dividing method you hold a twig and then the twig is supposed to vibrate in your hand when there is water. I don't see any science in it. Uh, just as there is no science, according to me, in astrology. Astronomy is science, but not astrology. So what divining is not science, but uh, resistivity survey is a scientific method of exploration for groundwater. Then a geophysicist employs geophysical methods of exploration like magnetic methods, seismic methods, electrical methods, and uh, finds out you know where the ore is or the, what the structure is. A geochemist essentially looks at the uh, chemical elements in earth samples like soil, sediment, rock, ore, water samples, and then uh, finds out you know where an ore can be. He also looks at you know the portability of drinking water, the environment, etc., etc. One can also become a mining geologist. You can go inside the mines and um, you know you can explore. I mean, having explored, you can uh, contribute to that direction. One can also become a petroleum geologist, either onshore or offshore. So here, you know, you basically look at a structure, structure or rocks that is favorable for accumulation of oil and gas and then you try to you know drill holes where you suspect there's a good oil deposit or a good gas deposit so that's a petroleum geologist can also become a coal geologist if you don't mind the black suit dusty thing in the mines so coal geologist you know looks at the coal seams and also a nuclear geologist, if you want to exclude from uranium and thorium. Now, uranium is found in many parts of India. The Atomic Minerals Division or the AMD, now they have changed the name to Atomic Mineral Exploration Directorate. So they look at you know, uranium resources and thorium resources. Thorium is found mainly in uh, uh, a mineral called monazite. It is abundantly seen in the Kerala coasts. Have you seen black sand there? You know, that area is rich in monazite. So that is the job of a nuclear geologist. And then, you know, you can also do teaching and or research. For example, uh, I chose to teach and do research. Although I had a job in the Geological Survey of India, class one job. But I, I joined, but I quit the job because my heart and soul was not there in that type of a career. I wanted to be in teaching and research and I joined Mangalore University. So it's up to you. So if you choose a career in earth science, in teaching and or research, you can go to universities. PNP means you have both private universities and publicly funded universities nowadays. And then you have colleges, schools. You know, don't feel shy to become a school teacher. There are many countries in the West where PhD in, PhDs in earth science don't go to universities, but they go to schools to teach young children, which is a much more challenging job than teaching uh, master's students or BSc students. And if you want to do only research, there are a number of uh, laboratories in the country, many CSIR labs and uh, some outside of the CSIR circuit. Mm, there are many of them. So they do research on solid earth. They do research on atmosphere. They do research on the oceans. They do research on rivers. 
and uh, planetary geology and everything. So if you're interested in any of these careers, you can uh, choose what you like to choose. Also, if you do not want to be going to any boss and if you want to be your own boss, then you can be a consultant, right? You can be a consultant in any of these fields. But uh, <clears throat> at a time when you are passing out, you know, your 10th or 12th standard, there's a huge question mark that must have arisen in your minds. And your parents must have asked you, hey, what do you want to do? All right? Perhaps some of them may have asked you to do MBBS, engineering, biotechnology. I'm not surprised. But as I said, there are many careers possible outside of those three uh, fields. And Earth Science is one of them. <clears throat> and Earth Science excited me and fascinated me for the past several decades. And uh, although I'm retired, I'm not tired of still talking about Earth Science. So if you have an inclination towards Earth Science, you're welcome. But if you think this is a boring subject and you're your heart and soul is not here, then don't join Earth Science. I would like to quote what my, my earlier boss at the Geological Survey of India in Jaipur said. I told him, sir, I want to go to Mangalore University <clears throat> because I like teaching and research. But he wanted me to be in the GSI. So he said, Shankar, ask yourself what you want in life. Ask yourself what you want in life. And a voice comes from within. A voice comes from within and listen to that voice. If you don't listen, then life will be a misery. And you will be a misery to others. I like the last part. You'll be a misery to others. So ask yourself what you want to be in life and you decide what you want to be. But whatever you choose, my dear friends, young friends, your passion should be in that field. Every morning when you, when you wake up, you must spring out from the bed, being enthusiastic of the work that you've chosen to do. All right. So these are the things that I wanted to speak and uh, many thanks for your time and attention. I put on my email address and mobile number. In case you want to contact me later, you're welcome to do that, to ask questions or to discuss any uh, topic of your concern or interest. But right now also, I'm there to, to answer your questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Most welcome. Um, are there any questions of online? Uh, yes. Hello, uh, this is Dr. Subbaya from MCNS. Hello. Uh, I cannot uh, see you. If you can kindly switch on your camera, at least I can see you. It is okay. <laughs> it's your, your option. It's okay. Yes, sir. This is Dr. Subbaya from MCNS. Hello, doctor. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, uh, just I would like to seek your comment mm -hmm. on the last presentation which you have made on the earth science as a career opportunity. So what is earth scientist do need to be a consultant? Sorry? I mean, what are the appliances the earth scientist needs to be a, uh, I mean, consultant in the earth science field? To become a consultant? Yeah. Now, number one is good knowledge and experience. Okay. You okay. must be thorough in the field where you want to be a consultant. Good knowledge and experience. Second, depending on the type of consultancy that you want to do, you may need certain instruments. Yeah, if you want to be a groundwater consultant, you need to have a resistivity meter. Simple example. Right. So can I ask another question? Definitely. Sure, sir, that uh, recently I had a, a, a TV news channel, okay, climate change is happening, 
uh, I mean, earth warming is taking place. The yes. they have shown that in a sub uh, Siberia, ice mountains have have disappeared, and the surface uh, is filled with water. Whatever the dead animals are there inside the deep uh, ice, now they are coming out in a different form of uh, worms and uh, what is that viruses like COVID-19. So the next generation of people how to face and they class call it a jet class virus. Do you have any comment on this type of uh, uh, questions? Yes. Uh, there are two or three things that you mentioned in your uh, second uh, question or comment. I think COVID-19 is not related to the type of climate change that I was talking about. It is mostly related to invading, humans invading natural habitats. And uh, fortunately, I'm a vegetarian and I don't eat any dead animals. But there are, <laughs> but there are people in countries like China, Southeast Asia, where they eat all sorts of things, literally all types of animals. You know, there are pangolins, which is a very rare thing, and they want to eat that. So that means, you know, we are going into natural habitats, disturbing them, and um, we are inviting microbes and um, microorganisms that were hitherto not coming to the humans. We're inviting them to come and attack us. That is what, you know, COVID-19 is due to. Okay, so that is not the type of climate change that, uh, you know, I was referring to. You know, I was referring to certain things that, you know, we have done and there are changes all across the world. You know, there are the frequency of wildfires has increased, the frequency of flooding, the frequency of droughts, all these have increased. It's all because of our, you know, activities. Did I answer your question correctly, Dr. Subaya? I, I, I mean to say, may, maybe you are not aware of that uh, Siberia is filled with the ice. Please, please speak close to the mic. I cannot hear you properly. Huh. Siberia. In, in Siberia is filled with the ice mountains, right? Yes. Now, because of global warming, ice has uh, melted and deep. Uh, 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 ditches have formed, filled with water. Then the new organisms and new microbes and new viruses will be coming in the future and and will be attacking the humans. I just want a comment, not an answer on this. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <clears throat> so what you're saying is because of the climate change in Siberia, there are holes forming and microbes that were hither to underneath, they are going to come up and they are going to have an impact on humans. Correct. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on microbes, therefore I will not be able to comment on that. Okay. Um, online, particip on, online participants, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Any questions in the chat? Uh, feel free to ask. Uh, online participants. In the chat box, there are no questions there. Chat box. Oh. Okay. Um, sir, I have one question. Sure. Uh, sir, uh, you you talked about that uh, Mangalore Airport, in the flat two. Huh. So that uh, when I when I um came to Mangalore uh, a year back, I saw that airport and even I was in shock. But I, I just wanted to ask that um, you said it is not safe. I mean, making a runway over a plateau. Is it? Um, uh -huh. Not such a short one, not, not such a small one, I meant. Ah, OK, OK, not such a small one. OK, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a risky uh, this thing. Yes. yes. Yeah, OK. Um, uh, one more question. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I'm Shalima hello. from MCNS. Uh, so I I was in Bangalore before coming here. 
so i mm-hmm. witnessed the uh, you know white topping which is going on in the city all over the city yes. so and then after that these floods were you know much more uh, you know uh, we had more floods after that and uh, i did hear this that that is one of the reasons uh, for this flooding so um, so i do you suggest any other uh, materials which should have been used instead of this uh, uh, concrete or whatever they have uh, used there i mean what could be something robust and uh, uh, do you have any comments on that yeah <clears throat> you are very correct uh, doctor <clears throat> see this is a very paradoxical situation on the one hand mm. if you concrete you'll have a good road and it will not uh, come under repairs for a long time that's good but what happens to the water mm. there's no percolation yes so i don't know but uh, perhaps uh, <clears throat> there must be some mechanism wherein you have some you know Oats. holes mm-hmm. even in the roads where the you know, water can percolate and you can have a a system of piping mm. which will take away the water from the roads and then into the drains yes, yes. okay and so uh, these are things you know we need to think but people don't think that is the whole problem mm. i want to narrate this i was my guide is professor kv subara from iit bombay he once called his friend and his friend son took the phone can i speak to your dad please the boy says sir he is thinking has anyone uh, sat down just to think people really do this anyway please go ahead with your question mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, thank you sir so the other thing is again about bangalore as you yes. said uh, there are these so many apartments have come up uh, very close to the lakes so um i i am not uh, from uh, uh, geology so i don't but i know that there is some distance that one should keep uh, from these water bodies when you construct uh, uh, you know any apartments or any uh, building so what is an ideal kind of uh, distance because i've seen them very close to the lakes so like lake view it is called and <laughs> it will be like <laughs> so what, what what is the kind of distances that they should have followed <coughs> Typically. Essentially, the BBNP, Brihad Bengaluru Mahanagar Palike, should set the guidelines. Mm. But who are sitting there? All sharks, Timingala. <laughs> no, honestly, this is what is happening, yeah. and they you know swindle money and give licenses. And who is there to find out who gave the license? You know, on the one hand, we levy penalty on the people who have constructed. houses or buildings at wrong places but have we ever punished the officers who gave permission for such constructions no so the essential thing is <clears throat> or the fundamental thing is you know wherever there is a depression okay depression need not be a huge lake like thing but generally even a small depression water tends to collect there this is the common sensical knowledge so try to go away from those areas and build your home or buy an apartment there not in a thuggu pradesh as we say in kannada not in a low lying area that is risky and this is what's happening in bangalore but i said common sensical right but common sense is uncommon okay thank you sir sure Sir, one more question. Uh-huh. Sir, uh, sorry to disturb you. <laughs> no, no, no problem at all. No, uh, uh, I have been uh, hearing that uh, earth falls suddenly. Earth caves in. A lot of water is coming up. So, so many re- uh, regions. Uh, I mean, it has been reported. And what is the reason? How to know earth falls before? land subsidence you mean land has subsided right yeah land, yes land just caves in yeah caves in goes down in its place some water bodies will come up water will be filled with that so you're not talking of slow going not down so. Su- uh, suddenly sudden I mean, collapse fine movement earth collapses 
and ha, ha, it ha. has been reported as, uh, in many of the places. Probably, you know, the foundation is not proper. Not uh, no no connection with the human activity. Ha. Just anywhere, uh, uh, sinkholes like uh, I mean, geologists we call it. We call it sinkholes, sir. It suddenly sinkholes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, any um, questions from online? Online participants. I want the high school students, 11th and 12th standard students to talk. <laughs> um, sir. Um, okay, no students are talking. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you so much uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, giving a wonderful talk. Even uh, I myself. Uh, oh, there is one one question, sir, in the chat box. Uh, I have a question, but I am a BS. Yes, you can ask. Even if you are a BSc student, please ask. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I'm a final year uh, geology student. Um, Amrita, um, one, one second, one second. Sir, hello, sir. Um, just, just one second. Sir, is not audible. Sir, you're not audible. Uh, just call. Uh, Amrita, sir, is joining back. Uh, just give me one minute, then you can ask a question. Technical issue, uh, sir is um, joining back in one minute. Yeah, please uh, wait for a while. Sorry for inconvenience. Uh, sorry, Amrita. Uh, you can write. Uh, you can write to sir because due to some technical problem, he cannot join. Uh, 
he's trying but uh, now we uh, we have another lecture after 15 20 minutes uh, if you have any questions you can ask uh, uh, okay okay thank you uh, 